Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizers for uh, or putting this wonderful meeting together and for giving me a chance to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my apologies that I was not able to be here in the past uh, four days. I had other meetings uh, in San Francisco for Grant Review and also in Pasadena. Uh, but it's a pleasure to join you today. Um, as you can see from the title of my talk, I'd like to talk about the, uh, some of the theories of wave interaction with, in four-dimensional metamaterials. And by four-dimensional metamaterials, of course, we mean in addition to the space variation for metamaterials, what would happen if the material parameters also change in time rapidly? Now, most of the metamaterial research, as you're very familiar with, deals with how to actually design a material with spatial inhomogeneity. I mean, and you have seen some of the talks you know, in, the, in this conference uh, how you know, different distribution of materials can actually give you some of the interesting properties. But one, what we got interested in, uh, in looking into uh, addition of time also in changing the material properties for several reasons. One reason is to expand the possibility of the parameter variation that we deal with. But there were two other you know, reasons and inspiration that motivated us to actually look into the four-dimensional metamaterial. One of them is the concept of time crystal that was introduced by the Nobel laureate Frank Wilczek in two to uh, 2012. Uh, what uh, Professor Wilczek uh, suggested and conjecture is that we all, of course, familiar with regular crystals. And what are crystals? Crystals is a three-dimensional distribution of, uh, of uh, atomic structures in space. So it's a periodicity in space. But what uh, Frank Wilczek proposed is that could we actually have something that would be periodic in time in the form of time crystal? That created a lot of debates, you know, uh, when he introduced that idea. And then uh, about almost, uh, I mean, two, three years ago, two experimental group, Michelle Lukin from Harvard and Chris Monroe from University of Maryland, experimentally verified that concept. Uh, another motivation that uh, really encouraged us to go into this four-dimensional metamaterial is the work of my good friend Matthias Fink uh, from France, who actually showed that if you actually have, let's say, a mechanical wave, and you rapidly you know, change, you, know, the, 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 uh, you move the, the structure, that will give rise to very interesting phenomena that he actually relates that to the time reversal. So uh, uh, this is actually from his paper in Nature Physics that you, know, you actually bring the uh, time reversal of the system of mechanical wave back. Now, so when we actually started looking at the four-dimensional metamaterial and time-varying platform, when we did the literature search, we found out that this actually, the concept of time-dependent platform has a long history. In fact, the earliest paper I was able to find was by Morgenthaler in 1958 that he showed theoretically that if you have a medium and you have a monochromatic electromagnetic wave propagating in this medium, what would happen if you rapidly change the phase velocity? of a medium while the wave is already there. And that actually led to quite fascinating, interesting possibilities. And since then, many, many I mean, people have been working on this right now. So for the next few slides, what I'm going to do is to show you some of the background theory that people have uh, worked on and proposed in the literature. And then I'm going to jump into what we are doing in my group. So as a matter of background, you know, uh, of course, we are all familiar with the very simple geometry of Fresnel reflection that we teach to our undergraduates. That if we have a, a, a system that you have two different permittivity with the I mean, uh, linear boundary over here, obviously, when we have a wave over here, we have a reflection and refraction. But that means the permittivity as a function of z has a rapid change in space. Now, there's an equivalent time uh, I mean, mirror of that as well. In other words, ask yourself this question, that if I have a medium and I have a monochromatic wave already in this medium, and then you rapidly change the permittivity from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, what happens? That would be the temporal version of what we are very familiar with in Fresnel reflection, which would be like a permittivity changes rapidly over here. By the way, when I say rapidly, let me mention as a footnote, it cannot be instantaneous, because in order to do that, you need infinite energy. But by rapidly, I mean the rise time of that is small compared to the period of your signal. Now, so uh, many uh, uh, researchers actually studied this in the past, as I mentioned, going back to 1958. And one of the interesting points that you consider, of course, the boundary condition. Now, 
uh, we always teach boundary condition to our student in the class. And of course, that completely relies on Maxwell's equations. And usually in the standard Fresnel problem, because that's a variation in space of permittivity, we have to make sure that the spatial derivatives that you see over here would stay finite. And of course, that leads us to a very well-known boundary condition that we're always familiar with that and we teach to our undergraduates. But what's the equivalent of boundary con condition for the temporal variation of permittivity? For that, we have to make sure that the temporal derivative in Maxwell's equation stay finite. And as a result of that, what that means is that if you have a wave already in the medium and you change the permittivity rapidly, what you have to make sure is vector d stay the same just before the change and just after the change. Because otherwise, then this derivative would be infinite, and that's not acceptable over here. As a result of that, then we can say that this product and this product should stay the same just before the time that this changes and just after the time, which means the electric field can have a uh, jump. Now, as a footnote, by the way, strictly speaking, we cannot write d in terms of that. That expression is valid only in the frequency domain. Strictly speaking, what we need to do is to write basically the convolution of that because it has a memory of the medium. And indeed, what happens is that if you consider this, uh, this uh, structure over here, this continuity should hold true just before the rapid change and just after the rapid change of permittivity. However, if you assume that your medium has a resonance at a frequency that is very far from the frequency of operation of your wave, then approximately one can write it in this way. So it's OK to write it in this way, but we have to bear in mind that mathematically that's an approximation, not an exact expression. OK, now, uh, uh, Agarwal, by the way, uh, showed that it's very interesting to see what happens uh, to, the, uh, to the wave. So imagine that you have a wave coming like this, and this is, again, I always uh, tell you the comparison and analogy with the regular Fresnel. If you have a wave coming with the frequency omega 1 and wave number k1, and it goes into this medium, that medium, obviously the frequency in the second medium is the same as the first medium, because the medium is linear, naturally. But the wave numbers are not the same, because phase velocities are different in two different media. That for the regular spatial boundary. But we have, if you have a temporal boundary, something different happens. So if you have a wave inside the medium with frequency omega 1, and you rapidly change the permittivity of the entire medium while the wave is still inside that medium, what actually remains unchanged is the wave number. In other words, wavelengths stay the same. So as a result, frequency has to change. So that is actually in plasma physics community known as photon acceleration. In other words, the people have shown it, by the way, in the cavity structure that we actually suddenly create plasma inside the cavity. The wavelength of the wave stay the same, but the frequency actually changes. That's known as photon acceleration, which, by the way, is an interesting phenomenon. So essentially, it's a nonlinear process, if you think about it, because you change the frequency there. Yeah. Now, so keep in mind, by the way, for the rest of my talk, that we need to make sure that this equality holds true when we change the permittivity rapidly. Now, uh, one of the interesting points is that, so if you start with a monochromatic wave going in the direction of positive z over here, if you do this change, what happens is you notice that the k1 stays the same, but of course, omega changes to omega 2, but you're going to have two waves. One of them is forward going. The other one is backward going. Why? Because the electric field changes its magnitude, but the magnetic field doesn't if you don't change the mu over here. So as a result, in order to satisfy the temporal boundary condition, we have to make sure that this wave becomes forward and backward. In fact, Agarwal showed that these coefficients can be written in this form. Now, this is interesting, by the way. If you look at this expression, it's kind of like analogous to what we have in the regular Fresnel reflection. But this is actually Fresnel reflection in temporal media that we have there. Anyway, so let me show you, by the way, a computer simulation just to give you a feel as to what happens. This is, of course, a standard boundary between two media with a higher epsilon here and lower epsilon there. And the wave packet comes over here. It's, it's almost you know, monochromatic. It's a narrow band wave packet. And you notice, of course, wavelength shrink over here as it should. <laughs> but if you look at the temporal media, something interesting happened. This wave comes over here. You rapidly change permittivity. It comes two waves, one of them forward, the other one backward. You notice, by the way, that the wavelength doesn't change, but the speed changes 
And that's one of the reasons that if you sit at a point inside this medium, the frequency is changing, but not the wavelength of that. OK, now, so this was all in the past, in the literature, and so on. But for the rest of my talk, I'm going to tell you what we are doing, by the way, in my group. We are working in a various different aspects of this phenomena to see how, what interesting physics we can have, particularly with also view towards application. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to share with you three and maybe four of different projects that we are working on that right now. We have more, and I'd be happy to talk to you in the coffee break as well. So one of the, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, interesting extension that we decided to think about is the following. We are all familiar, by the way, with anti-reflection coating that's used you know, in physics and photonics quite often. An anti-reflection coating, of course, works this way, that if you have two media and you have a wave coming like this, obviously you have some reflection and you have some transmission. And in order to reduce the reflection, one technique, which is very well known for several decades, is that you come over here and you put a finite thickness layer between the two media. And you choose the thickness of this to be land over 4 for the wavelength inside that medium. And the permittivity of this that you choose is the square root of epsilon 1, minus, uh, epsilon 1 multiplied by epsilon 2. That's, of course, very well known technologically used you know, all the time. We ask ourselves this question, is a temporal version of that? In other words, if I, have a me if I have a medium, let's say unbounded for a moment, and I have an electromagnetic wave inside this medium, if I rapidly change epsilon 1, you notice that we have a forward and backward wave. And I don't like that backward wave. Can I get rid of it? And the answer is yes. Actually, you can change it in two steps. <laughs> Just like what we have in anti-reflection coating in space, there's a temporal equivalent of that. So let's see what I mean by that. So imagine that this axis is time now. And the medium is unbounded. There's no physical boundary for the medium. And in that, you have this wave. And when you rapidly change the permittivity, you have a forward wave, backward wave, as we talk about. And I don't like that backward wave. I want to get rid of it. So in order to do it, basically, you change the permittivity in two steps. But the duration of that first step and the height of it is very important. That exactly follows the formula in the temporal version of anti-reflection coating. So not to bore you with the detail of the, of the derivation, this is a very well-known expression that we always teach you know, our students for anti-reflection coating, regular anti-reflection coating. And this is the temporal equivalent of that. You notice that this temporal equivalent is, uh, is, uh, is what we have over here. And you see the delta t is 1 over fourth of that, very similar to Landover 4. But this is equal to t over 4 over here. And uh, so let me show you, you know, uh, <coughs> some interesting simulation. This is uh, the wave is coming. We get a reflection, we get a transmission. This is standard, you know, boundary condition that we have there. And this is the uh, Fourier component of this. You notice that the frequency doesn't change. This is a spatial case. And uh, if I put uh, a very thin anti-reflection coating over here, then, of course, no reflection. So well, that's the standard anti-reflection coating that we have. And you notice, actually, the reflected wave almost zero over here in the frequency domain. But let's look at the temporal version of this. So uh, here, so let, let's, the, the, the simulation starts from the beginning. You have this wave packet. And at certain time, you change the permittivity. You see there's a backward wave and forward wave. And we don't like that backward wave. So uh, how do we get rid of that? So first, let me show you, by the way, the temporal variation of the field reflected, incident, and transmitted. And this is a Fourier component of this. And you notice, by the way, in the Fourier component, the, uh, the backward wave and forward wave has a different frequency. Wavelengths stay the same, but different frequency. And you notice, by the way, both forward wave and backward wave non-zero over here. But we don't want to have that backward wave. So what we do is that we change it you know, with two steps like this, boom, boom like that and see what happens. This one is coming over here, and then no backward wave is present there. So, so this actually gives us an, another interesting knob. In other words, physically, I don't need to add anything to the medium. Yes? Is this, is this like a transmission resonance? And, and no, actually, it's, but it's not a resonance in that sense that you think. But because we have two temporal boundary, the presence of the second temporal boundary has to be done at the point that basically cancels the backward wave. That happens, by the way, in the special case as well. In the special case, you have a lot of back and forth going over here. Here, you just have you know, two steps. 
And that step had to come at the right time. By the way, that time is not necessarily unique. Even though I say it's 1 over 4t, but it could be t over 4t, or 2n plus 1 over 4t. So we don't have to stay within that. We can actually extend it. But it has to be that specific delta t that we have there. And you notice, by the way, this uh, Fourier domain of this red curve is 0 over here, so no backward way. OK. So, uh, but of course, you might say, OK, this is nice mathematics, but uh, how can I have unbounded medium? I don't want to have unbounded medium. Actually, we don't have to. That's an interesting point about it. In other words, now we bring the space also into play. In other words, there is no need to have all the medium being unbounded. What we need to do is to change the permittivity only a section of the medium. While that wave packet is inside that section, we just change that. So here we have two media, epsilon 1 and epsilon 4, and those are spatial medium fixed. This medium over here is the one that we're going to change, the epsilon of that only. So the synchronization is important. When the wave packet gets over here, only you're going to change the permittivity of that part to basically bring it to a point and let the thing go to the other medium. So in other words, this becomes something like a spatiotemporal anti-reflection coating. You, only, uh, you not only use the space of it, but also you use the temporal of that. Uh, and uh, you see the, the Fourier transport. This actually reminds me, by the way, of what happens in the water lock in Panama Canal. It's, it's a very good analogy for that. The ship comes over here, you lock it, you bring the water up, you open the lock, you let it go over here, you lock it, you bring the water up. So essentially it becomes a water bridge. Now we are doing that, by the way, with the temporal aspects of metal material over here. Okay. Now, let's move to the second topic. <coughs> now we know, by the way, that in Maxwellian electrodynamics, Space and time have a very nice relation with each other. We use that every time. You know, we use Maxwell's equation. So many analogies between the space and time, and we have all seen that. But of course, there are also major differences between space and time. For one thing, time, because of causality, has to always go forward, number one. Number two, in space, we have three dimensions, at least, you know, in the, in the classical electrodynamic aspect. But the time is only one dimension. So we ask ourselves this question, is it possible that we use metal material and electrodynamics in order to give more flexibility to time? So, I mean, uh, among the members of my group, I call this temporal anisotropy. Now, what do we mean by that? I just showed you, by the way, that uh, one of the interesting aspects of this temporal metal material is you start with the medium with certain permittivity, and then at certain time, you're changing the permittivity rapidly. But both epsilons before and after are actually isotropic. That was the same number. But then, why do we have to stick with the isotropic medium? Why not make it anisotropic? In other words, if we start with the isotropic medium and homogeneous, and rapidly you change permittivity, when you change the permittivity, in that case, change permittivity to diff two different values for different axes. So kind of like this. So rather than having epsilon 1 rapidly change into one value, you can change it to two values for the two different axes for the electric field. So you take advantage of an isotropy of the medium and the temporal variation of that. So that's what we call it temporal anisotropy. Now, what interesting things can come out of this? Remember that this temporal boundary condition has to hold true just before and just after. But you notice, by the way, that approximately this multiplication should be equal to that multiplication. But here's an interesting point. If epsilon 1 is isotropic, but epsilon 2 is anisotropic, then that means that E2 not only changes its magnitude, but also changes its orientation. Because that matrix multiplication should be the same before and after the, uh, the time. So as a result, your electric field at that moment in time not only changes its magnitude, but also changes its orientation. And as a result, the pointing vector will change its orientation. So what happens to the wave packet propagation in such a medium? Now, my good friend Christoph Kallos uh, has done something similar to this, which he calls it inverse prism. And, but he's looking at a very different set of application that we are looking at. And I'm going to show you one of the applications we are looking at with this concept. We call it temporal anisotropy. So imagine the following. Imagine I have a dipole antenna. And you know, you know this, uh, we, we both like 
antennas. If you have a dipole antenna over here, let me assume oriented 45 degrees. And we know, by the way, that this actually radiates you know, in the donut shape radiation pattern. We are all familiar with it. But what if I do this? I keep this antenna over here, let it radiate, like a wave packet of that. And after radiation is away from this antenna, rapidly I change the permittivity of the medium surrounding this antenna anisotropically. Now, the wave number of that radiation should stay the same, according to this. But not necessarily the direction of the pointing vector. Let's see what happens. So uh, let's start from the beginning. Imagine that this is a dipole antenna, 45 degrees oriented. This is a regular radiation. And boom, we change that. You notice what happens. So the wave packet, rather than going into 45 degrees, is going to actually change the directions right midstream. So let's look at it again. So it's interesting because this should have gone, the uh, main beam should have gone this way. And it does just before we change the medium. Right after you change the medium, it actually, the direction of pointing vector changes midstream. But please note that this medium is completely, you know, unbounded. I mean, there's no physical spatial boundary that moved the pointing vector to other directions. It actually happened just because you change it from isotropic to anisotropic case. And the fact that instead of going 45, it's going like this is because we just decided to have epsilon 2x is greater than this, epsilon 2y or less than this. If you do it the other way around, it would go up. So you can actually control what direction you want the pointing vector to go. So we are looking at some of the interesting features of this. But one of the interesting directions that we are taking, we call it temporal aiming. Now, what does that mean? Now, we all know, by the way, if I want to have a radiation coming from an antenna in a particular direction there, I can create a phased array with the proper phasing, send the beam that direction. But what if I want to change the direction of the beam to this direction? I have two choices. Either I can change the phases of this antenna array, or I can mechanically move it, you know, just like a moving radar that we have there. But what if I don't want to do any one of this? What if I'm inside an integrated photonic chip, and I don't want to have an antenna array, and I don't want to change the phase, but instead, I change the medium. In that case, midstream, I can actually change the orientation of the power flow of this uh, beam. So a beam comes like this, and midstream, I can change the permittivity. It goes like this, and change it again. It will come over here. So imagine I have something like this. Oops. Three detector, three receivers, and I have only one radiator over here. And this radiator gives me a beam that ordinarily should come to detector one. Now, if I want it to go to detector two, I have to basically move this thing entirely rotating it or change its face. But let's say I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do as the wave packet comes somewhere over here, the timing becomes important. I just change the timing from uh, permittivity from isotropic to anisotropic. The pointing vector goes in this direction and change it back. We'll come over here. So in other words, I can actually control the, uh, the, the beam, the wave packet midstream in the direction I want this to go. So look at this. So this one is coming. It's designed such that the antenna would send it over here. But if I want to actually send it over there, and I don't want to touch the antenna problem, so what I do, I'm going to do this. This is coming over here. Midstream, I'm going to change the permittivity, moves over here, and then move it back over here. So essentially, I have something which I don't want to call it wave guiding. That's what I'm going to I call it aiming. Because in wave guide, we have actual physical boundary, like a cladding in an optical fiber. Here, the medium is essentially unbounded. Now, obviously, this would not be suitable for an open radiation because you don't want to change the entire medium. This would be very useful for the integrated photonic chips that we have there that we can control what direction this will go. So let's say this is another simulation. It brings it here. This one brings it here. So depending on how we change these values, you can actually control it in the direction you want to take. <coughs> so moving along to uh, the third item, this is something that we call it you know, frozen wave using non-foster elements. <coughs> now, what do we mean by non-foster? What do we mean by freezing wave? I'm going to explain. Now, we already saw, by the way, that uh, there's a lot of work you know, going already been done in the literature. What would happen if you change the permittivity in time from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, both of them being positive? 
Well, we ask ourselves just basically a curiosity-driven question without actually having any application in mind at first. Just out of curiosity, we ask, what would happen if I want epsilon 2 to be negative? First of all, is it possible for me to do that, like a plasmonic structure? Or if, it we can, if even we can do it, what interesting effect it has? Remember that the wave number should stay the same. So that means this equality should hold true. But here's an interesting point. So far, what I was saying is the epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 both are positive and greater than 1. But what if I want epsilon 2 to be negative? Now, if epsilon 2 is negative, this square root becomes imaginary. And in order for this to hold true, that means omega 2 has to become imaginary. So the frequency has to become imaginary. And still, the wave number stay the same. Now, does it have any meaning? Is it wave anymore, by the way? Let's take a look at it. If omega 2 is purely imaginary, then that expression that I showed you before with the forward and backward wave, then instead of omega 2, I have to come and put i alpha 2. And when I do that, I get this expression. Remember, by the way, that the k1 stay the same. But now you notice that this is purely real over here. One of them decaying in time. The other one is growing in time, no matter what alpha 2 sign is. So then, here was, was very puzzling to us. So essentially, that means this is not a wave anymore. It's not propagating anymore. It's frozen. So that was one interesting thing we observed mathematically. But then, immediately, we said, oh, there is some problem over here. We have to be careful. And the problem is this, <clears throat> that as soon as this omega 2 become imaginary, not real, then this expression is not <clears throat> monochromatic anymore. It's not a single frequency anymore. And if it's not a single frequency, what is the meaning of permittivity being negative? We all know, by the way, in metal material, we can have permittivity negative. But that permittivity negative has to be dispersive. I cannot have permittivity negative independent of frequency if our medium is passive. That would be against the Foster reactance theorem, which I'm going to mention over here. So, so in other words, does it mean that this conjecture is, impos is impossible? Well, hang in there. Actually, there's a way to actually go around it. But before I do that, let's ask ourselves this question. We know, by the way, that if you choose any passive medium, and in that passive medium, you would like permittivity to be negative, that permittivity negative has to be a function of frequency. I mean, you can prove it, and I'm going to show you what. That's known as Foster reactance theorem in electrical system. Now, Foster, almost 100 years ago, wrote this paper, by the way. It's a fascinating paper. I highly recommend this you know, uh, uh, to students, particularly. It's actually it's based on electrical circuitry, by the way. He was an electrical engineer. He showed, by the way, that uh, you, when you actually have a system, which is one port system, this one port system, if assuming it is lossless or very low loss, you can look into this and you see an impedance over here, the ratio of voltage over current or the ratio of E over H, you know, whatever the voltage you define, uh, impedance you define. Now, we know, by the way, in electrical engineering, we can write ZR plus JX. But because this system is lossless or very low loss, R is very small. So the entire impedance is primarily imaginary. OK, that's very well known. The question Foster posed is that one. If this x, which is the dominant term compared to this, is purely imaginary, or almost purely imaginary, how does it change with frequency? Can I change it with frequency any dispersion I want? The answer is no. There's actually a, a, a limit on that based on causality and based on passivity. And that is the derivative of this with respect to omega. I'm sorry. sorry. Sure. Uh, just some uh, terminology. What's, what are, what's, what's R and what's X? Oh, excellent. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for asking, Michael. Uh, this is impedance, and this is the real part of impedance, like resist resistance, and this is reactance over here. And by the way, intentionally here I'm using J, not minus I. Because in electrical engineering, this actually theorem was proved in electrical engineering. And based on that, this derivative is, is positive. Now, if in physics, and I use in physics notation, if this is plus i, then this becomes negative. But that's just a notational thing. But I wanted to stay you know, uh, faithful to the original paper that Foster wrote 
over here. So yes, so this is a resistance and this is you know uh, reactance. And if the system is lossless or very low loss, R is very small, but we just concentrate on this. Now, so Foster proved, by the way, based on causality and passivity, that the derivative of this with respect to frequency has to be always positive. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, in metamaterial, we showed that if you have any permittivity in passive medium, this derivative is always positive. <coughs> In fact, this goes back to Landau's work in Landau's book that you have this one there. You notice, by the way, whenever you draw, you know, dispersion of epsilon as a function of omega is always like this. The, 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 the slope is always positive, except when we go very rapidly during, around the resonance. But around the resonance, the loss is very huge, and this doesn't apply. So only outside uh, the, the resonance loss is applied. So, so that's, that's basically very, very hard boundary there. So I cannot have a passive medium in which permittivity is negative and in which that permittivity negative is independent of frequency. That's an impossibility. We cannot have that. But we don't have to stay with the passive medium. In fact, electrical engineers almost 60, 70 years ago thought about a way to go around the Foster reactance theorem. And they developed something known as non-foster circuits. Now, what is a non-foster circuit? That if you get actually a, a simple load, like a resistance plus you know, reactance, you can actually have a circuitry over here known as NIC, negative impedance converter. Negative impedance converter. Negative impedance converter is actually an active circuitry, easily available. People in circuits do it every day, such that when you actually put it over here and you connect it to a load, what you look into it, the load looks like this. In other words, minus a constant multiplied by the load that you have there. Please note the importance of a minus sign over here, which means that if I multiply this minus, let's say A is 1, by this, you notice that you get an input impedance that has negative resistance, which means you have gain, and you have minus Jx. That means you violate that slope, dx d omega being positive. Now in that case, this could be negative. But this actually is a very interesting system, and in fact, goes back to 1950s. Linville actually had created with two amplifiers. Of course, right now, the amplifiers are transistor, but in those days, they were vacuum tubes. Two amplifiers you put over here, you put a load there, and this circuit actually gives you this. So in other words, it is possible to have a non-foster circuit. So he said, aha, uh -huh, after all, maybe there's still some hope that we can develop that. So we went back over here. We said, OK, now let's go to the theory of this again. Now imagine that we have a structure. I don't call it material anymore. I have a structure that I force the effective permittivity to be negative. I'm going to show you, by the way, the design that we have. And actually, we are in the middle of the experiment on this. So if we have a medium which is epsilon 1 or some positive number, and then rapidly you bring it to negative, but when you bring it to negative, you have to hold it at negative. In other words, you have to generate, you have to pump it with energy. You cannot have it as a, as a passive medium. That's why you have the circuitry that has amplifier in it. So those transistors actually provide energy to the system to hold it, you know, intentionally to hold this epsilon of that. If you do that, you notice that the incident wave that's coming like this, it freezes. It freezes and grows exponentially. Now, here, in order to plot this, we had to use two different scales over here. Otherwise, this would have been just a you know, very faint uh, color there. So this comes over here. You freeze it. The field grows and grows exponentially. So of course, at some point, it's going to saturate and become useless. The interesting point is that as it grows, can it use it? Can we use this? The answer is yes. We wait only for a very, very short moment, and we bring the epsilon back to a positive number. In that case, what happens? You had a wave that was coming like this. You bring the epsilon to negative, or capacitor to negative. I'm going to show you that. And then you freeze the wave, and the energy of the wave increases because you're pumping the system with the external energy. And then after a very short moment, you bring the epsilon back to positive. By the way, when you bring it to positive, it doesn't have to be the original positive value. It could be another positive value, as long as it's greater than 1. So in that case, you can create a system that you had your original wave with the frequency omega 1, 
you freeze it, you actually increase pump it with energy, and then you let it go with another frequency. But when you let it go another frequency, it will go both ways. So this is what I call like a filling station. It's just like your car comes over here, stops, get the fuel, and go. <laughs> but we are doing it for wave. So <clears throat> a lot of interesting mathematics happening over here. Uh, I don't have time to go through the detail of that. But what happens is this wave comes over here, freezes, it goes up. And uh, look at the instantaneous pointing vector, by the way. It's quite fascinating. You notice the pointing vector is coming over here, freezes there. And uh, there's some very interesting subtlety over here that I don't have time to go through it. Because when the E and H is propagating, E and H are in phase. So the pointing vector, by the way, is notice that's always positive over here. And there's a net average positive there. But when you freeze it, remember there were two terms. One that was growing, the other one's decaying. That grow and decay would cause the zero crossing of E and H to actually go as about land over four. Because when we get to a point that everything is frozen, the net pointing vector is zero. The medium put a lot of energy into the system, but the pointing vector in half a wavelength is this way, the other half wavelength is that way. And you notice that over here. You notice that the pointing vector is positive and negative, positive and negative over here, and keep growing. But the net in, uh, in space, it looks zero. But the, the energy from those amplifiers is actually putting the energy into the system. And uh, now, then you let it go with different permittivity. And you notice what happens. You basically get the standing wave over here. So you had your original wave coming like this. You freeze it. You force it to freeze by actually bringing energy into the, into the structure. And after a short moment, you let it go. And the wave you know, goes both ways. Now, if, if you came back to the same epsilon, it would still go both ways. It would still go both ways. That's right. Pa and part of that is because the part of the momentum goes to the medium, and then you cannot get it back. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. But, but when you have two uh, going like this, you can get rid of one of them by some you know, directional couplers and so on if you want to. But yes, even if you come to the back, you get two of them. You don't get the first one only. Both of them have to be there. OK, now. So obviously, there is no material so far that has this uh, permittivity negative as non foster independent of frequency. By the way, we are working on that project as well. But, uh, but we said, OK, but we know this. There are circuits available for that. Why don't we actually show this in the transmission line? So we came up with this design. So imagine that you have a transmission line. And transmission line, of course, we all know is an inductor and capacitor. But what if we bring extra capacitor from outside with a switch over here, parallel with that, at a given time, boom, you bring the switch. And those capacitors are negative capacitors. Those are the non foster capacitors that I showed you. You know, the circuit designers have it. And so if you bring these capacitors over here, and this negative capacitor is larger than its magnitude, is larger than positive capacitor, this capacitor becomes negative. So you essentially have a transmission line that's an in, uh, inductor and a negative capacitor. Well, such a transmission line doesn't let the wave propagate, because the wave number would be purely imaginary, I mean, there. And as a result, you know, that grows. So uh, it, uh, I mean, the, of course, the negative capacitor could be made by this. If I put a regular capacitor over here and I look into it, it looks like a negative capacitor. And that's actually very well known in circuit community. So uh, uh, here, let me show you, you know, some of the simulation this we have over here. So it grows, and then when we let it go, it goes both ways. Now, in collaboration with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Firuz Aflatuni, next door to my office, he's expert in circuits. So I talked to him. I said, Firuz, you know, tell me about you know, this non-foster circuit. He said, well, we use that every day. So I said, well, let's design it. And this is the design we have. It's very interesting design, by the way. It uh, consists of 20. Uh, 27 or 28, I think it's 27 over here, of all this amplifier that you see over here. These are the transistors that you have over here connected to a capacitor. There is a switch over here. This switch actually make it on. This will come into this transmission line, and you have it like this. Now, by the way, we call this like a Frisbee uh, in, uh, in the lab. Now, one interesting point is why did we actually design it as a circular one? This is an interesting point. It's because we would like this one single switch switch these 27 capacitors at the same time to the circuit. That's very important, because all of them have to come to the circuit at the same time. 
So the circular design would help that. Now, uh, we still have some problem with this de design. Uh, we, are, uh, we, are, as we, we don't have a final answer to this yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Actually, I'm just one more, a few more slides and done. And thank you, Michael. And uh, so what happens, by the way, this is a very tough experiment. I tell you why. Because when you have an amplifier in the system, instability happens there. So when we are actually collecting the data, we notice there's a lot of noises that we have there. And that's understandable because we have an amplifier into a system. Any simple noise can be amplified there. So we don't have a final answer on this yet. Hopefully in the next few months, we're, we're trying to troubleshoot some of these you know, instability issues and to see. And the idea is that uh, when we send you know, the wave through this, boom, when we actually switch this one, we would like this wave to freeze and grows and then let it go again. So we'll see what happens. OK, finally, <coughs> can we use this concept of four dimensional for the ring resonators? Now, uh, the natural question that we uh, usually ask when we talk about this type of temporal variation of permittivity is that how fast should we change it naturally? I mentioned that one criteria is that the rise time should be small compared to the period of your signal. However, that is not necessarily the, the only bottleneck. The more important criteria is the following, that you need to change the permittivity of the structure such that during that change, the wave would stay in the medium. That is the more important criteria. So for example, if I have a slab of such a medium, uh, as the wave goes through the slab, I have to change the permittivity before the wave comes out. Because if the wave comes out, that it has its own frequency before I change it. So that's one of the reasons the change of permittivity should be rapid. But then we say, wait a second, there is an interesting way to go around this constraint. How do we actually imitate an infinite medium? Well, obviously, we cannot have infinite medium, obviously. But how can we imitate that? Well, we can imitate that by a ring. So if I have a ring, and I have a wave inside this ring, assuming the loss is negligible, that wave is inside the ring. So in that case, I can change the permittivity, not necessarily that fast. So we decided to look at a ring resonator. So we said, rather than actually changing the entire medium, can we actually just change the cladding of a waveguide? Because in some cases, that would be easier. So we said, OK, imagine that we have the regular waveguide that we have with the cladding. But rather than changing everything, we're going to change the cladding. So anyway, if you just change the cladding and go through the mathematics of that, you notice that that actually would do the same effect. Because when you change the cladding of a waveguide, you're changing its effective index. It's a different change, but it's still changing the effective index. So rather than f1 times n of the medium, is f1 times the effective index of the structure in that. And this is a mathematical expression, how you can change the epsilon cladding from one value to another value, and how much frequency change you can get based on this. So let me show you this uh, interesting simulation. You see, this wave is coming inside the waveguide, and then, boom, you change the cladding of that. You notice what happens. It's just like the way the cladding pulls the wave to slow it down. Let's take a look at it again. Because we are increasing the cladding from 2 to 6, the wave slows down. But it slows down from the outside. So let me just start from again. Oops. For some reason. Anyway, so um, the next slide we're going to show. Oh, here. So when it changes, look at the cladding, what happens to the wave. See, the wave actually pulls it down because the wave inside the waveguide would like to go with different speed than the other one. So we decided to use this and try to actually uh, have successive increase of the frequency through the structure. You send the wave over here, you change the cladding, frequency increases. You come over here, change the cladding again, frequency increases. You come over here, change the cladding again, frequency increases. But these are the same cladding. So you're just changing the same material, but successively. And the wave actually increases its frequency that you go through the system. So we decided to look at the ring resonator of that. So like this. And now you notice if I change the cladding, what happens? The wave speed up. And goes through this. There's, of course, some leakage that we have over here. So we decided to actually basically the same idea, but cascading it. So that actually gives us an interesting way, by the way, as a form of nonlinearity. In other words, rather than using second harmonic generation, 
in a natural nonlinear material, here we can actually change the cladding of a waveguide. Same cladding. You don't need to choose different materials. Same cladding and successively do that. Of course, you pay a price for that, and the price is the timing of that. Timing of that is important. It has to be done at the right time. So these are some of the results over here in the interest of time. Let me just uh, close it. This is the animation in the last animation and then the summary page. So this comes over here. You change it. Frequency increases. You let that comes over here. Couple in this one. You change it again. You come over here. Couple to this one. You change it again. Now these claddings are all the same, so we're just changing the same cladding, but at the successive time that we have there. So I want to thank you again, by the way, all of you and the organizer for, uh, for organizing this meeting and giving me a chance to be here. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to all of you. And so I wanted just to share with you some of the aspects of this four-dimensional metamaterial and wave interaction with that, that we are looking at it. Obviously, it has more degrees of freedom that you have uh, it in your hand by, uh, by putting also variation of permittivity. Of course, that brings a lot of interesting, for example, mathematics on that. One of the things we are working on this right now is that what kind of Kramer's chronic relation we have for this structure. So we're almost finishing a manuscript on that one. And uh, it's actually quite uh, interesting uh, connection with the mathematics of signal processing, that how we can actually generalize the Kramer's chronic relation for this type of structure for a medium that's changing with time over here. So, uh, and this actually can have some other interesting technological application as some of the things I mentioned with regard to the temporal aiming and some of the potential applications of that as well. Thank you very much for your attention.